Hi, Traveler, and welcome to the Fallen Star Season 1 Recap. A tale of action, drama, adventure, friendship, and a bit of romance. So sit back, relax, and grab a pint with me, won't ya? It's on the house. It all started when the goddess race found themselves in quite the pickle. The different races had always lived in harmony with one another in Historia. Crosslings, humans, vampires, mushroom nymphs, fairies, elves, dwarves, and witches. That was until the vampire race found a new ruler, Demetrius the Vampire King. Many world leaders went missing during this time. Faerun, the queen of the Nifflin Forest. Raleigh, the queen of the Isles of Nemsi. Jade, the queen of Juniper Valley and Conrad, the king of the Astral Kingdom, leaving only Demetrius in the very passive leaders, such as Fang, the king of the Wisteria Hills, and Avaria, lady of the oceans. People have had theories on what happened to the leaders, but those are just theories after all. A couple of months after the disappearance of the leaders, King Demetrius started to abuse his power over the vampiric city. Famine and filth grew more popular as the days went forward. Seeing the mistreatment of the vampire race, the other races teamed up and fought against the vampire royalty. Brave witches, crosslings, elves, mushroom nymphs, humans, and even fairies fought for this injustice. But sadly, they lost the war. We lost the war. Causing many lives to end. After the war, Demetrius seemed content with his amount of power. Like he had proved himself, the damn bastard. Ugh, anyway. Fast forward about a hundred years, give or take, the fallen stars begin. The goddess race knew they couldn't interfere. Vampiric magic is the complete opposite of goddess magic. If they would have fought, they would have ripped a hole in space and time itself. So instead, they sought out those pure of hearts from another world called Earth. They sent stars from the sky of Astoria to lure in the Chosen. Those people are the fallen stars. A lovely little group, I'll tell you that. They are Moon, the brave barbarian. Naoma, the careful artificer. Jackie, the twisted monk. Izumi, the cheerful cleric. Sierra, the enchanted druid. Nixie, the alluring rogue. Mo, the shape-shifting sorcerer. And Svana, the inquisitive fighter. They all awoke in Historia, well, except Mo, but I'll get into that later. When they awoke, they heard a heavenly voice coming from the skies above, telling the fallen stars why they were taken to Historia. By the fallen stars sent to Earth, now we need your help. Our world is being overtaken by the vampire race's crooked royalty. You must defeat the Vampire King and save the Vampiric region from their heinous rule, as well as prevent them from growing their rule to Juniper Valley. We believe in you, Fallen Stars. Save our world, and then you may return home once again. They were just a group of Earthlings. Somehow, some had sprouted animal-like ears and tails, grew fangs, antlers, horns, or just seemed the same. Some of the members were convinced that they were dreaming. Meanwhile, Jackie felt as if she had died, and this was the afterlife. She had just gotten into a car accident before teleporting. And Naoma? Well, she doesn't remember anything from before being on Historia. After many theories of where they got sent, they journeyed over to a tavern in the distance to try and learn about this place known as Historia. More specifically, the village of Juniper Valley. There they meet a very handsome lad named Willard, that's me. <laughs> I let them stay the night and have food and drinks in exchange for helping with some chores around the tavern. The group gathered around the fireplace, got a warm meal, and all introduced themselves to one another. Uh, no. Not ding, 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 ding. Uh, breakfast time for those who want it. I don't have a bell, so I have to use my voice. The next morning, Jackie, Sierra, and Naoma headed out and grabbed a shipment for me. Izzy and Svana headed to the docks to fish for me, and Moon and Nixty tended to my tavern's wheat fields. Jackie, Sierra, and Naoma laughed and complained over lugging the heavy crates of mead and wine to the tavern together. Izzy and Svana talked about their new abilities and their upgraded bodies, 
Svana and Izzy saved some turtles from being stuck in the boats by the dock, and then fish until sunset chatting. Meanwhile, Moon and Nakesy theorized about Willard, me, <laughs> and if Historia is like Narnia, wh whatever that is. After another night's rest, I sent them out to go find an old friend of mine, Kryn, the blacksmith, cashing in on an old favor in exchange for weapons for the young group of adventurers. I wanted to help them out. After all, they reminded me a lot of my old friend group. I miss them dearly. The group met Kryn, a unique dwarvish man who makes the best weapons in all of Historia. Kryn gave them not the most welcoming hello, but stunning weaponry. On the way home, they learned of something strange. They couldn't die. When fighting a horde of undead, Naoma fell to their strength. But when they died, they woke up back in the bed that they had just slept in the night prior, rematerializing themselves thanks to a blessing from the goddesses. But when that happened, those affected felt off. Let's just say, Naoma seeing her cold, lifeless body before it faded away was quite scary. The group headed back to the inn and tavern and rested that night, hoping that the insane resurrection they were gifted doesn't come with any negative side effects. The group the next morning talked about how they were surprised that all of them hadn't died already. None of them had ever fought with swords before. Svana seemed like a natural swordsman, though. But the only one with prior experience with anything similar was Nakesy, for she had taken fencing lessons back on Earth. The group, after exploring the town a bit, decided to split up and gain resources. Svana, Izzy, and Nakesy went out to make a little hobbit home in the cave. Whatever the hell a hobbit is. Mining in the caves to gain resources, Naoma went off on her own to figure out everything by herself, wishing the group luck before heading off. Jackie, Sierra, and Moon went into the forest to harvest fruits from the trees, as well as collect wood. Later on, Sierra decided to room with Savannah, Nixi, and Izzy in their hobbit home. Since she hadn't had time before dark to gather enough to build her home, she ended up wandering around all night before coming across the hobbit home. Izzy, a couple of days later, made it her mission to make beds with nice blankets that are colors they like. She searched all around for flowers so that she could find enough dye. While on her search, she bumps into Naoma, who had been making a foxhole-inspired home on the side of a mountain. After talking about their future plans and Naoma showing Izzy around her home, they part ways, letting each other know that they're always welcome in each other's homes. With time, the fallen stars grew stronger. Izzy and Nixie became sparring partners. Nixie taught Izzy all she knows about sword fighting. Izzy renovated a house into a guild hall for the Fallen Stars to train in, as well as taking up a part-time job at the library to spend her days researching the history of her story. Nixie collected many kittens and bought a house with Svana near the forest in Mushroom Manor. Nixie felt a calling to explore other cities for answers, leaving the others behind for a bit. Izzy prayed to the goddesses, hoping for answers. She then started building her own place on a small island full of wisteria and cherry blossom trees right off the coast of Juniper Valley, near Naoma's base. Izzy started learning magic, mainly potions that enhanced abilities. Mo opened their eyes, entering a whole new confusing world. Izzy came across a person standing within the altar for the goddess race. The same place the Fallen Stars first teleported to in Historia. The person rubbed their eyes and looked like they had just woken up. Izzy went to see if they needed help, finding out they are from Earth too. They had been stuck in the realm between realms for weeks. They introduced themselves as Molly, and Izzy showed them all around. She taught them what the Fallen Stars are, and what they're meant to do here, and how they'll get home if they defeat the Vampire King. Molly goes off on their own finding that they struggle to stay awake during the day. Something about the moon brings them power and makes them energized. 
Molly starts to realize that they don't only have to present feminine in this world. They can fully express their gender fluidity. They wished before falling asleep one morning that they could look the way they feel inside. That night, they woke up to see their body had become more masculine. Their clothes, hairstyle, even their body type had changed to fit the fact that they felt more masculine that night. Then, the next time they slept, they changed back into their feminine form. They learned that they could shapeshift overnight as they wish. They decided to start going by Mo, wondering how they granted their own wish, and scared of Izzy's reaction if they saw them in this form. They stay to themselves for the most part. Sierra bought her own home, right near the Hobbit Hole. She starts feeling more and more attracted to nature. On Earth, she hated the outdoors, but since she's been on Astoria, she has felt a deeper connection to nature. She wasn't sure why. Jackie found an old abandoned home and renovated it, dying many times in the process. Becoming more and more of a hermit after each death, she contemplated whether or not she was actually in the afterlife. Naoma began building an underground fortress and upgrading her armor and weapons to keep herself from having to experience death again. She collected many pets and buddies along the way. She also found an ore with unique properties. She brought it up to Izzy. Izumi hadn't heard of it, but was fascinated when it showed its properties. Naoma decided to research this more on her own. Moon found a nice spot for her home building a nice home a bit away from the others, liking the bit of isolation, the peacefulness. Moon seemed to get better and better at fighting, embracing her badassery. She also began speculating on if the others are trustworthy or not, sticking to herself for the most part. Svana found two adorable puppies, naming them Puddle and Pear. Svana became intrigued by Kryn the blacksmith, wanting to learn how he crafts such beautiful weapons. Kryn at first is very opposed to the idea of helping anyone learn how to craft weaponry. Svana apologized for intruding on his time and asked if there's anything she can help him with as a thank you for his time. Kryn sent her out to grab a shipment for him and to deliver a butcher knife that he made for the baker. Kryn asks for her name and then says her name is too complicated and that he'll just call her C. Svana asked what he has the most fun making and Kryn talks about a staff that he made for someone that is magical. Kryn doesn't say who it was though. Svana prayed to the goddess race, giving them gold as an offering, confused on if it'll work or not. She started to get angry at them as she prayed. She thought about how she needs to go home and how summoning her was selfish. Why me have a family, people that I cannot afford to leave behind? I do hope that you one day allow me to gain understanding. The morning after, she woke up to a present with a label on it, saying that her questions would be answered with time and to trust the goddess race, giving her pears as a gift of peace, her favorite fruit. Svana struggled to trust them, but she says she'll try. Svana visited Kryn again and asked to help repair the sword he gave her. Kryn teaches her the basics of bladesmithing. Svana gets excited at just the idea of him teaching her. Svana then asked me how she would go about planning a party for the Fallen Stars. Meanwhile, Sierra bumped into Izzy. Sierra was staying at her second home in the Mushroom Manor, and Izzy was still doing renovations on the Guild Hall. Izzy showed her around the Guild Hall so far, and asked her to help take some stuff from her base to the Guild Hall. They both headed outside, as Sierra started to hear a voice calling her from the forest. Izzy is confused, not hearing what she does. Sierra started wandering towards the forest, and Izzy said she wouldn't let her go alone. The girls headed into the forest, the voice getting louder for Sierra. Once in the forest, they saw a fairy doing a ritual with a tree. Confused, the girls asked what they were doing, and they explained that it was a fairy ritual to help the forest. Suddenly, the fairy noticed Sierra's antlers, shocked and asking if she was related to the past ruler of the forest. The fairy told the story of Faerun, and the girls are still confused as to why that has something to do with Sierra. The fairy asked to teach Sierra about the forest. Izzy told Sierra to be safe and yell if she needed help. She stayed near by the forest in case Sierra needed her. Sierra ventured further into the forest with the fairy, barely able to keep up with her. They came across a tree that's been dedicated to Faerun. Suddenly, a wand appeared within the bark of the tree and extended out to Sierra. 
Zira, from then on, started to learn plant magic with her gifted wand. A couple of days later, Izzy casted a spell and it backfired, turning her hair pink and her eyes flickering between a couple of colors. That was a weird one. Uh, anyways. One evening, the fallen stars all noticed a letter for each one of them at their respective doorsteps. A letter from Svana, asking them to attend a friendship party. A party to get the fallen stars all closer and bond over festivities. They all headed to the town square, where I had prepared food and drinks, and Svana had decorated the square with some advice from me. As each guest arrived, they noticed after a bit that Jackie and Nixie hadn't showed up. Mo hadn't received an invite yet since Svana hadn't met them yet, and didn't know where they lived. Svana knew that Nixie hadn't come home in a bit, but just assumed that she was doing her own thing. Jackie had been hiding away in her home for a while, so that wasn't too big a shock. The group ate tons of delicious food and danced around. Suddenly, they noticed a strange man watching them from afar. The stars brushed it off. Svana said that she will nickname the stranger. I'm going to refer to them as Brock. They continued to celebrate and the man got closer to the party, talking with vendors at the town square stalls. Izzy asked if Svana had invited them and Svana said no. Suddenly, Izumi got a stabbing pain in her stomach. She started to feel a pounding in her head. Naoma then started to feel it too. Poor girls. Naoma guessed that it was possibly just nerves. They ignored their discomfort, and I started telling a story about the good old days when I was part of an adventuring party. I commented on how it was cut short. Naoma and Izzy commented on how their stomachs were feeling way worse, and the pain was getting intense. Naoma and Izzy sat down as the group noticed the man, Bracken, watching once again. Svana started to put it together, this mysterious man showing up. He must have had something to do with the sudden illness plaguing Izzy and Naoma. Svana snapped and began to chase. She chased the Bracken all the way to the library, cornering him in front of it. <laughs> you all are so naive. You believe you'll be able to defeat the Vampire King. <laughs> Pathetic. The group is shocked. Izzy tried to calm down the group, but Naoma wasn't having it. The bananas! Hey, 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 uh, it's okay, it's okay. No, no, it's not okay. He probably has a family or something, you know? What, do you think I'm gonna him? kill him? Is that what you I, think I'm gonna do? Listen! You should let him go. You lot are not in any state to potentially fight a creature. We do not know what this person is capable of. And you both are not feeling well. Think of the odds. It's not worth it. Oh, not to find a cure. Or you'll keep getting sicker and sicker. But poof! <laughs> Goodbye, fallen stars. Bracken ran away. Izzy wanted to follow them, but started coughing up blood. As I started explaining how vampire venom works. When bitten, it turns other creatures into vampires, but when eaten or drunk, it poisons them, slowly withering away the person. I suspected Bracken must have slipped vampire venom into the food at the party. I mentioned a friend of mine that might know something about a cure. I wasn't sure if they knew anything honestly. I just knew that he was powerful, and I had hope. Svana understandably snapped once again. She asked if I had known someone, why wouldn't I share that information with them right away? She started spiraling, plunging deeper into her anxiety. I cut her off. I explained that my friend's power is greater than anyone else, and that means it's dangerous. I didn't want them to have to ever ask for help from him. I need to speak to them before I can say much about them because they have a very peculiar situation. If they die because your friend refused to help them, I wish mercy upon your friend. When Izumi heard Svana say that, her heart calmed. Going from being riddled with anxiety and struggling to breathe to knowing everything will be okay, Svana made her feel safe. It was the first time someone did that for her. 
I agreed to clean up the party and talk to my friend about the possible cure. Izumi finally showed off the guild hall to the fallen stars. Savannah noticed Naoma and Izzy getting slower and coughing more. Savannah started to beat herself up about not being able to help her. You don't have to know the answer, Savannah. I, yeah, yes I do. Zvana explained that she didn't want to have to go through what she had with her mother again. Her mother has cancer. It was on her deathbed when Zvana had been taken to Historia. That's the reason she wants to go home so badly. She needs to be by her mother's side when she dies. Izzy promised that she will get Zvana and everyone else back home. You're old, but I promise that I will try my hardest to get you back to your mom, okay? They talked about how Bracken is the first vampire they've met besides Jackie. They all decided to check on Jackie, since they hadn't heard from her in quite a bit. When they arrived, everything seemed fine. Normal. Until they headed upstairs. A blood trail led to a notebook. She had written about how she didn't know if she was actually alive or not, and how she needed to find an easier way out of here. Repeating the phrase, I'm not dead, over and over, until the quill's ink ran dry. Izumi began to crumble, feeling as if she had failed her. Izumi started crying as Naoma comforted her. I told them we'd get back home, why didn't they trust me? Izumi snapped as Svana rested her forehead against Izumi's, reassuring that Izzy didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing you could have done, and it's not a matter of trust. But you're one of the most trustable individuals that there are amongst us. On their way home, Naoma and Izzy talked about their symptoms, cracking jokes to lighten the mood. But as soon as Izumi closed her door, she began to break down again. Naoma, once alone, let out her anger at the situation, wondering how far she is from losing her sanity like Jackie. Zvana, Sierra, and Moon went to check on Kryn since Bracken had ran down to his place when escaping the stars. Kryn explained that he is fine, and he told them the vampires are often seen in that area, and that he's fought many vampires in his life. When Svana brought up my friend, who may know about a cure, Kryn commented on how it's a mutual friend, and he warned them not to feed their ego. Svana mentioned that the area in front of Kryn's place feels off. Svana apologized if she'd ever seemed cold, and offered Moon to stay with her if she feels weird being alone after today, since she lives so far out of town. Moon took her up on the offer for tonight, sleeping on the couch, but before falling asleep, she pondered, gazing out of the window and thinking about how she doesn't have much to go home to. She actually kind of wants to stay in Historia. Svana started training with Kryn, after a bit of convincing on her part. <laughs> Kryn tried to teach her not to hold back or hesitate when fighting, egging her on more and more, since he can tell that she isn't fighting to kill. Eventually, she gives in and swung her sword with all her might. Kryn showed pride towards her, and reminded her that vampires will not hesitate when fighting her. For the next couple of weeks, Naoma and Izzy became weaker and weaker. Svana let her dog stay with Izzy to keep her company, while practically bedridden. Izumi attempted to continue to tend to her farm and take care of her farm animals, but just by doing that would leave her exhausted. She reminisced of the days that she would spend all-nighters, training against the undead zombies roaming around, and by the end of the night, watching the sunrise whilst nodding off to a book in her hand at the library. The only books Izumi had been able to get her hands on is when Savannah would come visit her, bringing her books from the library she thought she might enjoy. Meanwhile, Naoma got so frustrated on how her symptoms weren't going away, but she didn't want to burden Izumi with questions since Izumi was also sick. But she felt as if she had no choice. She debated it to herself for a bit, trying to convince herself that they'll find a cure without her bothering Izumi. Finally, she came to her senses and went over to talk to Izumi. Naoma headed over to Izumi to ask about how she was feeling and if she had found out anything else about a cure. Izumi had researched a bit about teas that help with illness, but has failed to find out how to cure vampire venom since there's little to no research about it. Izumi did find out quite a bit about a war that happened a hundred years ago, 
and how even though the vampires won, a lot of vampires tried to escape and become citizens of Juniper Valley to get away from King Demetrius. Some sadly weren't lucky enough to get out. Izzy pitched the idea of asking me about my old adventuring party that I had mentioned prior, as well as the friend who possibly knew about a cure. Naoma and Izzy headed to the tavern. On their way, they contemplated if they trust the goddesses. Izumi wanted to trust them, but Naoma just wanted to talk to them, and she said that she doesn't think she'll ever trust them. When they arrived at the tavern, I offered them some tea to possibly help with their symptoms, even if it's only a bit of help. They started to sip it and asked to talk. We all sat down and they asked their questions and I answered. I told them about the two friends of mine that could possibly help. The first of the two being Bonnie, an interesting botanist who runs a plant shop in the town. I explained that she might know something about an herbal cure for the venom. I explained that Bonnie was a part of my old adventuring group. She was Bonnie, the electric druid. Oh, how she kicked ass back in the days. She was quite the plant-based fighter. Naoma then asked about the friend that I had mentioned after the party. His name's, um, well, it's Wukong, Sun Wukong, if you want to call him by his full name. He, he's an interesting fella. Been around for as long as I can remember. He argues that he's the strongest there is. He loves, uh, peach sake. Well, I'm the only one that supplies it, so maybe that's the only reason he comes to visit me. I explained that he has a power that I don't understand, so it would be worth asking if he knows anything. The girls asked if Wukong was part of my adventuring group, and I explained that we asked him once, but he declined. I assumed it was because he didn't get along with one of the members, one close to the goddess race. He, he didn't get along too well with her. Is she still around? <sighs> no, no, she's uh, not. Oh, uh, oh I'm it, sorry. It's all right, it's all right. <laughs> uh, she actually probably would have been able to help you a, a lot. Now she had a she had a knack for pretty uh guess you'd call it um holy magics. Ah, Lily. Lily the graceful cleric. My Lily. The two lasses headed home to try and get some rest. Izumi reminded Naoma not to overwork herself. Naoma pretended not to hear her. Izzy rolled her eyes and headed inside. They planned to tell the others about what they had learned soon. Naoma pondered to herself, wondering why talking to the goddesses makes her so angry. Wondering why they'd grab humans from another world just to fix their problems. Naoma's iron golem, Frank, gave her a pat on the shoulder trying to comfort her. Naoma can't tell if Frank can actually feel emotions. Naoma continued working on her underground fortress. For the next few days, Izumi practiced a new spell, one that lets her connect with the others telepathically and speak to them. She hasn't had a chance to try it on humans, but she tested it on the farm animals and they seemed to hear something. Izzy was unsure if that told her anything or not, though. Savannah decided to bring her dogs home and visit Izumi. Izumi had headed out to tend to her crops one morning and Svana appeared. Svana asked how she has been feeling and explained that she'll be taking her dogs back home with her. Svana showed off her new sword, and Izumi talked about her new telepathy ability. Izumi decided to use her telepathy to gather all the fallen stars to the guild hall, so Naoma and her could tell them about Bonnie and Wukong. Izumi began the spell, and Svana watched in awe. Svana heard Izumi's voice echoing through her head, confirming that it at least worked on her. They both started heading over to the guild hall. One by one, the Fallen Stars heard Izumi's voice in their heads, and decided to head over there to investigate. Most of the stars were in shock by the idea of hearing a voice in their heads. Izumi explained what I had told them about Bonnie and Wukong, and the group decided to go to the tavern to talk to me more about where to find them. I explained that Bonnie owns a garden shop near the bank, and Wukong tended to disappear into the snowy mountains near town. I offered them peach sake to lure him out and make sure to tell him that I sent them. The stars headed off to Bonnie first, discussing how Wukong sounds familiar, more specifically tales of the Monkey King. They arrived at Bonnie's shop and meet her. Hello? Uh, we, we were sent by Willard. Um, are you Bonnie? 
Oh, hello, hello. Um, would you like seeds, flowers? What is it? I have it all. The group was taken back a bit and tried to find a space in her speech to interrupt her rambles about her plant babies. Finally, they interjected that they're looking for a cure for vampire venom. Vampire venom? A vampire cure. There's a thing called a vampiric rose. It has the ability to cure most illnesses. It sadly got picked in near extinction, so I don't have any. Be careful stirring up trouble with vampires. Bonnie then ran to tend to her plants, leaving the stars confused and wondering what just happened. The group, after a moment, realized that the vampiric rose sadly may just be their only hope but the chances of finding one are slim to none. They all head over to the snowy mountains, having their peach sake at the ready as a bribe. After a bit of yelling, they saw someone peek their head over the top of the mountain. Once they told them they had peach sake, Wukong leapt down, landing in front of the group. Wukong went to take the peach sake, and Azumi hid it behind her, explaining that they wanted information in exchange for the sake. They explain the situation, and Wukong says that they might be able to help. He explained that the goddesses don't like him. Svana explained that they were chosen by the goddesses. Wukong asked which goddesses, and then the group explained that they didn't know. Wukong told them to go figure out who sent them here, and then come back and tell him, and if the goddess isn't too bad, he'll help them out. The group decided to agree, and headed off to the altar that they had first come to the world on. The group gets to the altar and tries to pray for a bit, and finally Izzy gets fed up and yells at them. Hey goddesses, come down here, we need fucking answers. Nice. Is that good? That's a good one. Oh, oh goddess. A goddess flew down, asking what they needed. The stars asked the goddess's name. Oh, apologies. I forgot I never properly introduced myself. I am Navia, the goddess of winter. How may I assist you all today? Izumi explained that Noyoma and her had drank vampire venom. Oh, my. I, I'm sorry you are sick. We did grant you immortality, so hypothetically, if you died, you shouldn't be sick anymore. But every time you die, well, never mind. It should be fine. Uh, hold on. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, every time you die and get reincarnated, there's a small chance you'll lose a bit of your humanity. What? I doubt it any of you have been affected yet, and I'm sure one more time will not hurt. Do you know how human emotions work? Well, not exactly. I'm sorry, Fallen Stars, but I don't know what the cure is either besides using your immortality to reincarnate with full health. Nivea left, and the stars spiraled wondering how many times they needed to die for it to affect them. Suddenly, they remembered what happened to Jackie, wondering if that's why they went crazy all of a sudden with no signs beforehand. They tried not to dwell on it, and then they headed to talk with Wukong again. On the way, they discussed their views on the goddesses, and specifically Nevia, hoping she was a good goddess and Wukong trusted them as well. Let's hope that Navia is one of the good ones and that he helps us. If he doesn't, can I punch him? Ah, uh, yeah. I get okay. The group went to Wukong and told them that it was Navia that they were working with. Wukong agreed to help them, offering them slices of a peach that granted him his immortality. Naomi and Izumi took the slices and ate them. Suddenly, they felt their bodies become stronger again, gaining their speed and strength once more. They felt completely better or even better than before. They thanked Wukong, and he continued to be cocky as Izumi and Moon rolled their eyes. Moon challenged his immortality, and Wukong told her to hit him. Naoma offered her sword that lights opponents on fire for Moon to use, telling her to be careful. She swung and lit Wukong on fire, slashing through his chest. The slashes didn't even bleed, but instead instantly healed itself. He seems unharmed by the flames. Izumi gave him the peach sake as promised. Then he shook off the last of the fire and headed back over to the mountain, leaving the stars. Izumi thanked the group for helping Naoma and her find the cure. They offered to buy everyone drinks at the tavern. They all headed to the tavern and talked about their future plans and how they will start training more intensely soon. They wanted to make sure they were bringing something to the group, something to balance everyone. Zvana and Izzy departed from the group later on, 
and Izzy planned to teach her on how to garden, since Svana had been talking about starting a garden for a while. When they got back to Izumi's, it's very late, so Svana slept over at Izumi's. They fell asleep, talking and laughing. The next day, Izzy taught Svana how to garden all day. Izumi couldn't seem to wipe the smile off her face for the rest of the night. Izumi had put up a board within the guild hall for townsfolk to post different quest jobs. Naoma had decided to check the board and found a poster speaking about a thief who stole from the bakery with a witness named Willow. Naoma continued to explore the guild hall, contemplating whether to help the baker or not. Suddenly, Svana entered, spooking Naoma a bit. Naoma was hyper-focused on the posters. Svana spoke about wanting to help the baker with their wanted thief. Svana asked if Naoma wanted to take up any of the quests on the board, and Naoma said she doesn't know if it's for her. Svana then asked if she would like to attempt the thief quest together. Naoma was unsure at first, but then agreed. They decided to head over to the bakery. They arrived to the bakery and saw a man standing in the corner. They spoke to him and found out that his name is Willow. He explained that the thief had green skin and seemed to be a dwarf that had ran off to the west outskirts of the town. The girls headed off and found themselves in the forest, noticing smoke arising. They snuck over and the camp seemed empty. They found a chest full of cheesecakes, bread, and emeralds. They assumed that this place was abandoned, but suddenly, a bunch of green dwarfs came from the thick of the forest. Svana and Naomi were startled. They began to fight the group of thieves, knocking them all out after a bit of a tussle. They gathered the loot and decided to return the goods to the bakery receiving an amethyst shard from Zack the Baker as a thank you, as well as some freshly baked cakes. Naoma tells Svana to take the reward, and Svana tells her to take it since they wouldn't have found the thieves' camp without her help. Naoma agreed, but told Svana to keep the emeralds they found at the camp. They split the cakes, and Naoma had a moment on her way back to the guild hall where she remembered something about her life back on Earth, remembering being quiet in group settings. Naoma shook it off and continued back to the guild hall. The two took down the quest sign for what they had just completed and parted ways. Naoma went home and thought about how fun going on an investigation, as Svana called it, was. Svana went over to Naoma's house a couple of days later and asked to go mining with her. Naoma agrees and the two of them bond as they go from cave to cave mining resources. But suddenly, when Svana starts to talk about how the vampire nicknamed Bracken was able to get away with poisoning them, Naoma stayed silent. Finally, after a while of hearing Svana theorize about how the vampires did it so slyly, Naoma let out her inner thoughts. I have to be sure. Were you the one who did that? Or did you have any idea that was going to happen? Do you think that I would poison them? I don't have any reason to think that you wouldn't. Svana agreed that she technically would be the first suspect, thinking rationally. But still, hearing that hurt Svana. After a bit of back and forth, Svana told Naoma that she will prove it to her, proving her innocence. Naoma, after talking with her, let her know that she believed her now. She just wanted to make sure, but Svana had now made it her mission to prove herself to Naoma. Izzy began upgrading her garden and extending her land. Needing to get more dirt, she started heading to the other side of the town, where she had already been getting dirt from. But, when she passed by both of the goddess shrines, she heard voices calling out to her. This confused her. She didn't have much of a connection to the goddesses, especially no more than any of the other fallen stars. Then it hit her. Her curiosity for the goddesses could be helped if she practiced being a cleric. She decided to go talk to me in the tavern about the cleric that was part of my old adventuring group. She arrived and asked if we could talk. We sat down, and I explained that her name was Lily. I explained that she was my wife, and she practiced her cleric magic through potions and rituals. She kept journals on what she was learning. Izumi continued to ask about what Lily was like. It was nice getting to talk about her again. Izumi decided to try and research about being a cleric, attempting to learn where to begin. Before leaving the tavern, Izzy mentions that there's a lot she wishes she could tell me. She hadn't told me a lot at that point, but I don't blame the girl. 
Mo learned over time when isolated that when in their feminine form, they feel a lot more creative and timid, but in their masculine form, they feel more protective and outspoken. Overall though, they seem to still feel very timid in this new world. Mo went out to try and explore the town more, running into Izzy. Izzy didn't recognize them at first, since they were in their masculine form, but then quickly noticed it's the person that they'd known as Molly. Izzy said that she had missed Mo, but also asked why they'd looked so different. Mo explained that he could shapeshift, and he isn't sure how. Every day they transform into how they feel inside. Izumi thought that's very cool, which warms Mo's heart. Mo explained that they were looking for sugar cane. Izumi told him that Naoma might have some. Mo got nervous since they hadn't met Naoma yet or any star besides Izzy for that matter. Izumi offers to come with them to ask Naoma for some sugar cane. They head over and Naoma introduces herself to Mo. Izumi asked if Mo still goes by Molly and Mo explained their new name. Izumi introduced Mo to Naoma and they asked for sugar cane. Naoma gave them sugar cane and complimented Mo's cloak. Mo told them that he made it and Izzy asked if he could make her an outfit as well. Mo agreed and Izzy gets super excited. Only a few days later, Mo finished Izumi's outfit. He gave it to her and she paid him for his hard work. She adores her new outfit. A few days later, Izzy decided to leave a letter at Moon's house, saying that she'll be picking sunflowers in the area in a few days and if she'd like to train together. Izzy was really just using it as an excuse to get to hang out with Moon. While delivering the letter, Izumi noticed a new sign in the distance. A road sign pointing towards a couple of different villages. Izumi decided to try and see how far away Wisteria Hills is. Before she could reach Wisteria Hills, she found a tent. After exploring the tent, she then turns around to see a person in knight's armor. She readied her weapon and apologized for intruding, telling them that she didn't mean any harm. The knight recognized Izzy, and Izumi recognized the knight's voice. It's Nixie. Nixie takes off her helmet, and Izumi asks where she's been. Nixie explains that she's been in the Astral Kingdom, and then Wisteria Hills. In Wisteria Hills, she stayed with a head guard, and was just about to head back into Juniper Valley after staying there for a couple of months. Nixie and Izumi talked for a bit, catching up and then heading back into town. Soon after getting back in town, Nixie remembered that she left some of her things behind in Wisteria Hills, so she went back to grab them. The next day, Izumi was picking sunflowers nearby Moon's place when Moon noticed her and came out asking why she was over near her house. Izumi asked if she had read the letter, and Moon asked what letter, then proceeded to go to her mailbox and read the letter. Moon, after a bit, finally agreed to train, and then Izumi and Moon started training. Izumi told Moon that she'd pull her punches to start. Izzy went for a punch and hit her in the shoulder. Moon shrugged it off, but before she said that it wasn't that bad, Izzy went in for another punch. This one was harder though, and square in the jaw. Moon's eyes began to glow and a red aura grew around her body. She was absolutely pissed. She ran at Izumi and punched her, sending Izumi to be pushed back a couple of feet. Izumi holds the spot Moon punched with wide eyes. Excited by what power just got unlocked, Izumi told her to do it again. Moon was confused and wondered what just happened. Izumi punched Moon again, hoping to make the rage mode activate again, which it does, but Izumi ended up with a bruised rib. <laughs> Izumi and Moon finished training and then started talking about how their lives had been. Somehow their conversation turned into talking about smack talking. Izzy isn't very good at it. Moon tried to teach her how to smack talk, but wasn't very successful. They parted ways and headed home. The next morning, the stars awoke to sounds of screams and smoke littering the air. They ran out of their homes, some immediately being ambushed by vampires. The group fought off who they could, and they all tried to find each other. Once they had all gathered, I started to help them devise a plan. When plotting out our plan, I noticed someone standing in the burning barn. I focused on them and noticed that it's Julian, one of the Vampire King's head soldiers. The man, no, the monster who killed my wife, my Lily. My vision turned red, 
and I sprinted full force towards him. I began swinging my sword at him, the damn bastard dodging every swing. Someone's angry. Funny thing is, I don't even know why. I'm not supposed to fight. Only babysit these times. But I guess if you give me no choice. As he started to fight back, slicing my arms and chest and running in circles around me, I'm not as agile as I used to be. I will kill you, Julian. I will avenge my wife. Just run while you can, old man. When Julian started to sprint off, Izzy immediately began chasing him calling for Moon to join her. They ran, and Julian led them to the altar of the goddesses. Izumi told Moon to be the brute force, and Izzy would attack from the fall. Moon started to attack Julian, and Izzy ran and hid from a distance. Julian seemed to be with him. Julian seemed to be winning the fight, and was standing over Moon as Moon was catching the breath. Enraged by the fact that Julian was looking down at her, Moon broke out her rage mode and started beating Julian's face in. Damn! You actually made me bleed! That's cute! Izzy pulled back her bow, and when she saw an opening, shot him with an incredibly potent poison arrow, sending him to yelp out in pain. Shit! Poison? <laughs> While distracted by looking at Izumi, Moon wound up and hit him with all of her might with her barbed club, sending him to scream out in pain and fall to the ground, dead. Burn in hell, Julian. Wow, you can't smack dark. I've been practicing. Meanwhile, when Svana saw Moon and Izumi run off, she decided to run to Willard's side. She told Sierra to join her and the two ran to the library, seeing hordes and hordes of vampires as they got closer and closer. Suddenly they heard Kryn yelling at vampires. They ran down and tried to help fend off the vampires. Svana continued to get cornered. Kryn blocked the vampire's path, and they all retreated to the front of Kryn's shop. Svana's mind started to race, putting it together piece by piece. This doesn't make sense. She asked Kryn how long the mine had been shut down. He explained that it had been shut down since he was a kid, so at least 150 years. Then it clicks for Svana. Coming from under us, coming from the old mine shaft. That's where the vampire city is. We need to tell the others. Do you understand what this means? Sierra and Svana ran to get the others. Meanwhile, that was also happening. Naoma asked Mo to join her in putting out the fires. They started by heading to the bakery, putting out the wall of fire. Zack the baker thanked them. They headed to the bank. Inside the bank, they saw a crying mother holding her baby. They distract the vampires so that the mother and child can run off. Suddenly, Naoma saw someone watching, and without warning, began chasing them. They led them to the bar. No, I, I mean no harm. I'm not here to fight. I'm, I'm here to help you guys. I want none of this violence, as do many others stuck down in the vampiric city. You're here to help us. My name is Francesca. I'm here to deliver news. The king doesn't see you as a threat. He has his guard down. He thinks the poison in this rampage would make you quiet. I'm one of his maids, so I don't think it's a good idea to attack now, as that would be very dangerous. But there, there is a ball uh, celebrating the 101st anniversary of him going into power. It's a masquerade ball, so it's perfect. And it's a perfect chance for you guys to sneak in. The two thanked her, and she ran off. Mo asked why Naoma didn't explain why they were chasing the vampire girl. Naoma said that she didn't need to explain everything, especially to someone she barely knew. We're supposed to be a team. Teammates don't go missing for months, especially while we're being poisoned and attacked every other moment. You know what, let's talk about this later. It's not the time right now. Svana and Sierra gathered up the fallen stars and explained to them where the vampire city is. I arrived as they started to explain it. Izzy said that they should head down to the vampire city and cut them off at the source. Who made you the leader? Svana and I, I found the city. I, uh, sorry, I- oh, I'm sorry, I what was... did you say to her? Look, I was thinking the same as Izumi. We should make sure no more vampires come and attack. But maybe Sierra has a point. I, I mean, maybe we should stay away from where those terrifying vampire creatures are coming from. Hey, unlike you, Mo, we actually, you know, fight our problems, not hide away from them. 
What the hell? We've been training for this for months. We only trained when Issy told us to. Sierra, I never asked to be the leader. I never wanted to be the leader. I just wanted everyone to work together. The group continued to argue when I suddenly snapped. Be quiet. Wait. <sighs> you all need to grow the hell up. <sighs> this is people's lives at stake. And here you are arguing like a bunch of children instead of working together as a team. You're all strange. I don't understand half the things y'all talk about. Whatever Earth is, why you're so obsessed with death and the goddesses. Whatever all I've ever done is help you and I don't ask questions. So please, listen to me. And don't repeat history. Don't let the pressure break you up as a team. And look, <sighs> I can't stop you from going down and seeing their sickness for yourself. But if you do, do not start a fight. If you do, Sierra, well, Sierra and Mo, they'll most assuredly die, followed by the rest of you. That king, that monster, he would not allow you all to live. You'd be dead by sunrise. You're right, Willard, and I hate that I'm agreeing with you, but if we want to go home, we at least need to work together. Once we get home, we never have to see each other again. The group headed down and I stayed behind and helped save people from the burning library. The group explores the vampire city a bit, getting a look at the castle. Naoma and Mo explain what they learned from Francesca and the ball coming up. The group then saw the gate of the castle, with a swarm of vampires behind the gate. On top of the entrance is a familiar vampire, one who'd poisoned Izzy and Naoma, the once Fauna named Bracken. <laughs> the king was right. You did come down here after passing our little test. Well done, stars. Well done. That is what you're called, right? Either way, I have a question. Why did you think you could dumb come down here? To win? Foolish! You are weak little creatures. It's almost cute. I'll give you two options. One, you leave and don't come back. Go live your life and stop getting into a war you're not fit to fight. Or two, I open this gate, releasing these vampires that we starved just for you. I wonder how they would react. So hungry, getting their first meal to be such a rare foreign meat. I must say, stars, I am curious about what would happen. A shiver was sent down the star's spines. Naoma and Izzy were fuming, wanting to rip this vampire apart for what they did to them. They all looked at each other, waiting for someone to say something. Svana contemplated to herself, wondering if they had bit off more than they could chew. Hundreds of starved vampires were ready to dig into the fallen stars, only being held back by a lunatic who had tried to poison all of them. Suddenly, they heard a loud explosion that rattled the world. The fallen stars turned and began to leave, scared of what the loud explosion may have been, and wanting to check on Juniper Valley above. We need to check on the village! What was that? Ugh. Lame! Ugh. Shut up! Just so you know, Zumi, please. if you come back, I'll kill you. They ran back up to the surface, first trying to get through the way the vampires came. Then they learned that they aren't as acrobatic as them, so they used the cave instead, hoping it leads to the surface. Once on the surface, they saw a beam of light coming from something in the distance. The group heads over and stops when they spot Wukong and Nevia. The group hides to eavesdrop. Nevia asks what Wukong had done. Wukong explained that he was trying to get back home to his reality, and rather than getting back, he accidentally brought stuff from his world through the realm tear. Nevia told him to send it back, and Wukong says he doesn't want to and doesn't know how to. Nevia noticed something different about Wukong. His magic was stronger. Wukong explained that the magic from his world was now in Historia. Nevia told Wukong to teach the Fallen Stars how to use it so they don't die trying it themselves. Wukong didn't agree until Nevia proposed a deal. 
His old deal would be disbanded. He could go anywhere he wants and interact with whoever he wants again. But he must train the Fallen Stars on how to use his magic. Wukong agreed, seeing this as basically having freedom to cause mischief again. Nivea flew off, and the Fallen Stars approached Wukong. Wukong assumed they heard everything. Wukong explained a bit on what his magic is and how it's stronger than any magic they have dealt with thus far. He said how he will teach them. He said how it'll be a lot of work, but if they're committed, they'll get the hang of it. So, do you want to, Yan? They all agreed, some more reluctantly than others. Then, Svana brought back up the fact that they all seemed okay with never seeing each other again. Izzy asked to talk with Svana in private. They headed off to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Izumi explained that she really cares about Svana, and that she promised to find her back on Earth. Svana apologized for accusing her of not wanting to see her again. Izumi said she will always forgive her. I'll always forgive you, Svana. No matter what. Because at the end of the day, not forgiving you is not worth losing you. There we go. Phew. That was a lot of talking now, wasn't it? Now, go on. Get ready for season two. G'day!